Good everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kathy. I work in the reference department upstairs. Before we get started, I'd like to mention there's a little table outside by the door that has some questionnaires on it. If you take a few minutes and fill them out when, as you leave and then put them in the box, that would be great. It does help us for future programs. Today, we have Ozark Bronze Bell Ensemble. They've been with us, oh, 10, 12 years, minus COVID pandemic time. We have a full house today. I am so grateful to see every one of you. So let me introduce you to Charlotte Scott. She's the conductor, and she will take over at this point.
hello, hello, hello. We are the best bell choir in spitting distance. <laughs> and it's Christmas time. So I can't think of a better tune to start our holiday concert with than Christmas bells arranged by Sandra K. Tucker in 2016. It sets just the right tone for a fun afternoon of holiday cheer. We are so glad you chose to start your Christmas celebration with us. Our next piece isn't quite as perky, but it's equally fun to hear. This dynamic setting, which is based on an old English folk tune, because aren't they all, moves from intimate to majestic with colorful harmonies and the optional, but it's never optional for us, because more is better, <laughs> use of hand chimes thought by some scholars to date back to the Middle Ages because, don't they all? <laughs> King's Fold is a folk soon tune set to a variety of texts in England and Ireland. You may know the tune by some of its other arrangements, such as All You Who Seek a Comfort Sure. Can you hear it in your head yet? I heard the voice of Jesus say, O oh Lord my God, I thirst for you. This version is a fantasy on King's Fold arranged by H. Dean Wagner in 2000.
now on to the 16th century <laughs> for everybody's favorite God rest ye merry gentlemen. The song tells about how Satan has laid humans astray, but by staying merry, which meant mighty back then, gentlemen and women may remain in the peace and happiness that was brought by the birth of Christ. The moral of this story is not gloom and doom, but to comfort and joy. See what I did there? That makes it the perfect tune to go door to door sharing with your neighbors. So the next time carolers stop by your house, don't shut the door like I do. Open it wide and picture that nativity scene. See the excitement of the shepherds as they realize what an important moment they are witnessing and wait patiently for the arrival of the learned men from the east, searching for signs of wonder foretold. Look up for the star that they charted and followed for so long and see the looks on their faces when they saw that beautiful child for the first time. Imagine holding those precious gifts fit for a king. Cynthia Dobrinsky's 1986 arrangement of God, ye Mes God Rest Ye Mary is our way of sharing some good tidings with you this season.
based on the 96th and 98th Psalms, but with a decidedly New Testament flair, Joy to the World tells the story of life on earth after the coming of Christ. It reminds us to make room in our hearts for the King and to sing of his greatness. Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. That's why we're here with you today to share the good news and our music. The first few measures start delicately with individual bells combining their sound to become a joyful chord. Then the tune comes in and it's supposed to be played spiritedly. We'll let you decide. Feel the excitement build as more and more bells are added and the tune becomes just a bit more complicated. In a way, this piece is easier because there are no sharps or flats. So the challenge becomes to make the reader, the listener, feel what is written on the page. The middle section is supposed to be mysterious. Watch out for the fog building on a cold morning. When the tempo picks up and the volume increases, see the smiles of people throughout the generations sharing their faith with one another. In a world of instant exposure, fame and gratification, remember that this is what real joy looks like. Joy to the World, arranged by John Benke in 2012.
Green Sleeves, a ballad recognized around the globe, has endured through the centuries, captivating listeners with its haunting melody and mysterious origins. Its timeless beauty has been reimagined in various genres, including classical, pop, and folk. The earliest known reference to green sleeves dates back to 1580, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. Many legends surround its creation, the most popular being that it was written by King Henry VIII for his lover, Anne Boleyn. However, historians mostly debunk this theory, as the style of the song aligns more with the Elizabethan era after Henry VIII's death. Facts, boring facts. Besides being an influential monarch, though, Henry VIII also was a talented musician. They might not have taught you this in school. He was a composer and a poet. He played several instruments, including the lute and the organ, and is credited with composing several songs. His interest in music and the arts and his tumultuous love life have often led to speculation about his authorship of various works, including Green Sleeves. The tune is also used in the Christmas carol, What Child Is This?, written by William Chatterbox Dix in 1865. The lyrics were changed to depict the nativity of Jesus Christ, a stark departure from the original theme of unrequited love. It's a testament to the song's versatility and the enduring appeal of its melody. Jason Krug's 2017 arrangement of Green Sleeves adds a new level of excitement to the holiday hit. Thank you. 
You know, I don't care who wrote it. I bet they didn't see that coming. <laughs> I don't know if they're pleased or not, but, but that's where we are. We are at our halfway point, which means I get to thank you all for coming here. We are so lucky to be in a community that has such a beautiful library, that has such a beautiful system, that can invite all of these strangers to come in and unite over their hopefully love of handbells, but if nothing else, their love of a free concert on a beautiful day. If you're not familiar with handbells, today is your lucky day, because I've got 12 of the most talented bell ringers in spitting distance who would be more than happy to tell you all about it. We, um, we do this for fun, we do this for glory, we do not do this for money, uh, <laughs> but it is very expensive to do what we do. We are a, uh, a 501c3 uh, charity. It's, uh, we raise money, but we do not charge for concerts. So thank you for coming and reminding us that that's the way music is supposed to be. If you do have any questions, want to be a part of our organization, like everybody else, we have a Facebook and a website which are moderately moderated. Feel free to interact with us and let us know you're out there. Um, if you play bells and want to get better, come talk to us. If you have a church that wants to host us, come talk to us. If you just think we're very attractive, come talk to us because we're just so darn glad to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to perform the same concert in case you just, well, with different mistakes and different ad-libbing, but basically the same conversation um, next sa Sunday at um, Rolling Hills Baptist Church at 3 p.m. And we're very grateful to Rolling Hills. They are our host our host church and provide us space and some equipment, so we're grateful. So feel free to come to that. And then if you're from Fort Smith like I am and want to um, hear bells in the River Valley, we'll do that the next Saturday at 4 at St. John's Episcopal, and that's all on our website. Our next piece has a lot of history, and it's not all that pretty. Coventry Carol is a reference to the Massacre of the Innocents, an event described in the Gospel Bless You of Matthew. In it, King Herod orders the execution of all male children in Bethlehem under the age of two. The story goes that Herod did this because he heard of the birth of a baby who would become the king of all the Jews. News that was relayed to him by the Magi. Yet Joseph, having been warned by an angel, escapes Bethlehem with Mary and the newborn Jesus to Egypt. The song then is a lullaby supposedly sung by the mothers of Bethlehem to their doomed sons. Though it still certainly isn't among the most well-known of Christmas songs, Coventry Carol became more widely known in 1940, after Coventry was bombed by the German Air Force during World War II. On Christmas Day, the BBC broadcast the provost of the Coventry Cathedral, giving a speech in which he attempted to forgive those who had carried out the attack. Afterward, the choir sang Coventry Carol in the cathedral's ruins, with the song's melancholy subject matter taking on a new meaning. This 2013 arrangement by Keith Burt, with its haunting minor key and unexpected meter changes, will remind you of how much we have to be grateful for this holiday season.
I got another story. <laughs> it's the story behind the delightful Christmas song called The Sussex Carol. Research shows that it was first published in 1684 by Bishop Luke Wattage in a collection entitled <coughs> A Small Garland of Pious and Godly Songs Composed by a Devout Man for the Solace of His Friends and Neighbors in Their Afflictions. Because why not? If you get to name a book, name it. This was his first year serving as the Bishop of Ferns. I'm guessing he had something to prove. <laughs> it was a small town in the southwestern corner of Ireland. The book was well received, and since it contained 11 carols, helped establish the tradition of carol singing in that part of the country that continues to this day. One of the carols was On Christmas Night, All Christians Sing. Jumping to the 20th century, there is a great English composer, Rafe Vaughn Williams, who had, been a, who had a keen interest in English folk songs. On May 24th, 1904, he was wandering through the southern part of England, as one does, near a small settlement called Monk's Gate, asking people to sing songs for him. And someone, instead of kicking him in the, the shins, he identifies them in his notes as Mrs. Verrill, sang this carol for him. Quickly, he jotted it down. Since then, it has become quite popular and is now known as the Sussex Carol, since it was rediscovered in Sussex County, England, even though that first publication was in Belgium. In 2003, Arnold Sherman brought us this lovely arrangement of the carol under the title, News of Great Joy.
admit it, when you think of Christmas, the inn with no vacancy, the manger, the lowing cattle, the infant, the landlocked city of Bethlehem, you think of ships, right? <laughs> As it turns out, there are no boats in any of the biblical accounts of Jesus' birth. The Jews of Bible times, in fact, were generally quite terrified of open water. Only fishermen routinely set sail, and that was on the comparatively placid lake called the Sea of Galilee. But that doesn't stop. I saw three ships from being a favorite Christmas song. Now, does it? No. There are some interesting theories. Ships that may have brought the biblical Magi relics to the Cologne Cathedral in Germany in the 12th century. This is the most commonly held belief if you are ever on Jeopardy. <laughs> also, the coat of arms of Wenceslas, King of Bohemia, not that Wenceslas, who bore a coat of arms, Azure Three Galleys Argent. My favorite theory behind the song is that camels, which exhibit an extraordinary capacity to travel great distance between drinks of water, are known as ships of the desert. Some historians believe the three ships sailing in represent the Magi's visit to the young Jesus, which is reported in Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Regardless of the questionable facts or metaphorical value or um, unsavory geography, our friend and Ozark Bronze founder, Carrie Johnston, arranged a version of three ships in 2005, which will rock your stockings off.
song's actually like a five for one. Did you hear all the other carols in that? Nestled in there, isn't that fun? I like that a lot. The, um, the Silent Night Christmas Carol was first performed in the Church of St. Nicola in Obendorf on Christmas Eve of 1818. Both Father Joseph Moore, who had written the lyrics, and Franz Guber, who had set them to music, performed the song in front of a traditional nativity scene. Joseph Moore accompanied the song on guitar. For many years, it was thought that this was because the organ had broken down, and there's a lovely story about that, and it's not, it's just not true at all. He didn't just pull out his guitar and say, oh, I can do this. It's actually written that way. Um, but now historians believe that the guitar was the original accompaniment, and the arrangement for organ was written later. But it's still a nice story. Not as good as <laughs> ships on the Galilean still <laughs> sea, but regardless. Well, it would be amazing to have heard it that first night with just a guitar, a choir, and a make-believe manger. There is something about this song that sends chills down our spines all these years later, no matter how it's orchestrated. This is a 1990 arrangement by Betty Gary that shows us how delicate handbells can be in telling a story that we never get tired of hearing.
not going to lie, we've been working on this stuff since August, and it didn't feel like Christmas yet. But today, <laughs> today is the day. It's the first day we get to play it for people that we're not legally married or otherwise related to. And it makes it... <laughs> It makes it real, and it makes it joyous, and it makes us Christmas. So thank you so much. We've um, got one last song before we let you go, <laughs> and it doesn't need an introduction. I'm just going to read some of the words. Good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now you hear of endless bliss. Jesus Christ was born for this. He has opened heaven's doors, and we are blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Thank you all. As she said, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Be careful on your way out. Remember, if you have a minute to fill out the questionnaires. Happy Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>